Good morning. It is a delight to be with you here uh, at our online service of the Green Memorial United Methodist Church. And as we celebrate uh, God's work in our lives here on this day after the United States Independence Day. Uh, uh, we will have communion in a little while. And so I encourage you at some point in the service, if you uh, haven't thought of it or uh, haven't had a chance to uh, pick up something uh, for communion uh, from somewhere in your house, it could be uh, for bread, it could be a piece of, uh, from a loaf of bread, it could be crackers or rice cake, uh, grape juice if you have it, or another fruit juice will also work. Uh, you can even use water if, if nothing else is available. If you have just one or the other, that's fine too. Um, so we will get to that uh, toward the end of our service. Let us now worship God together. Our opening um, introit is something that uh, Melanie has put together for us. Join with me in the call to worship. You will not necessarily hear one another, but uh, be assured that our voices are joining in with you. Uh, please join with me. Listen to the good news. God is with us this day and every day. As in the days of Jesus, the blind received their sight. So may we see you, O gracious Savior. As we receive our sight, as we see you more clearly, May we also see our sister and our brother, the hungry and the poor, those who are black, brown, white, yellow, those who live next door and those who live half a world away, all our neighbor to us when we call you Christ. Help us see, O oh God, that you're always with and for everyone. Open our eyes as we sing, open our hearts as we pray, open our lives as we worship you this day. Our opening hymn this morning is uh, a song that is, uh, by its, the very title of its tune, a national hymn, one that is uh, sometimes used at patriotic occasions, but also one that reminds us who our ruler truly is. Hymn 698, if you have a United Methodist hymnal, but the words will also appear for you on your screen, God of the Ages.
I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer. You do not tarry, O God of all goodness, to show us your favor. You hasten to hear us whenever we call. Bathed in the brightness of your radiant love for us, we can see clearly your care for all that you have made. Through Christ now, open our eyes to the splendor of your redeeming grace. We worship you, God, Christ, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity forevermore. Amen. I am delighted to have for us this morning for our, our special music, a recording that Margaret has made for us of a piece called Shout to the Lord. Mara has for us our uh, scripture reading this morning. Today's reading is from Esther. However, it's only a snippet from Esther in the middle of the story, so here's some background. The book of Esther, although short, really packs a lot of maneuvering, personal pride, and scheming. You know, things that make for a political story. The main characters are the king, who is Persian, and has become upset with his previous queen and has dismissed her from that position and has started a search for a new queen. Esther, a beautiful Jewish woman, who the king chooses to become his new queen. Mordecai, a cousin of Esther, who has raised her and has promoted her rise to become queen. And Haman, a man who has been promoted by the king to be the top official. After Esther has become queen, Mordecai, who has been hanging around the gates of the palace, um, seeing how things go and still make, supporting Esther as he can, ha hears of an assassination plan against the king between two of the king's eunuchs. He gets word to Esther, who then lets know the king of this attempt on his life. Um, Haman becomes very upset with Mordecai, who refuses to bow down before him, a high king's official. And he seeks the king's permission to not only kill Mordecai, but all Jewish people, as they will not down before the king and his officials and are disobeying the king's command. After venting his displeasure with the lack of respect he feels uh, shown towards him by Mordecai to his wife and friends, they recommend that a gallows is built in their yard to hang Mordecai when the time comes. Mordecai lets Esther know about the plan against the Jewish people and asks her to seek the king's audience to reverse this decision. This is at great peril to herself as one doesn't simply go to the king 
king unless called, which she has not been. However, the king sees her and invites her to talk, and she invites the king and all of his top officials to a feast, which she puts on. This goes so well that the king says he will give her anything that she wants. She says that she would like the king and Haman to come to a feast, and then she will tell the king what she would like. Now, to pick up the story, it's from Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, also verses 9 through 10, and then it skips to chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it will be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition, and the lives of my people. That is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace, but no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to King Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked, wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both he, near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Dare and also the 15th day of the same month year by year, as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, and that they should make the, them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. Thank you, Tamara. And um, that's quite a lot to the story of Esther. Some of you may not have, have heard it before, or it may be one that you haven't thought a lot about, and I would encourage you for your own devotional time this, this week or in the weeks ahead to give some attention to Esther. Um, the theme of uh, today is about speaking truth to power and how it takes courage and integrity to do that. Uh, the title of my sermon this morning is Finding and Using Your Voice. Finding and Using Your Voice. But would you please pray first with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A minister was speaking to a uh, class of boys on the merits of moral courage. And he said, by way of illustration, so suppose there were 10 boys sleeping in a dormitory and only one of them knelt down to say his prayers. Now that is moral courage. Now boys, would any of you like to give me another example of moral courage? Please, sir, said one boy. 10 ministers were sleeping in a dormitory and only one of them jumps into bed without saying his prayers. I suppose it could be fun to joke about uh, moral courage um, throughout our nation, indeed throughout the world's history, uh, including up into the present time. It is not easy to be people of courage. So often we do not wish to rock the boat, to say the unpopular thing, to risk our lives or 
risk our standing are really to take risks. Um, in some ways, the church in this way has been too silent so often. It's hard to find our voice when there are so many other interests that want to speak for us or even use us. Esther is a, fa a fascinating, I think, kind of story. Many, if you've read, uh, if you've read some of Esther, will find that uh, it is often cited that it's the one book in all the Bible that does not mention God. Uh, because of this, some felt it did not deserve inclusion in Scripture. I am very glad that it is. Sometimes in our lives, God's presence doesn't have to be named for it to be obvious God is at work. Or to put it another way, it doesn't have to be explicitly said out loud what God is doing if it's clear that God is a part of what is happening. This story of Esther can be looked at from many perspectives, but I, given our current conditions today, and it's always it's been fascinating doing this series, which I planned long before COVID-19, how much this series is speaking to our present situation and how many of these stories I've, I've rethought or sermon ideas reworked because of, of our present uh, conditions. But Esther speaks to these in many ways. One of those is as a, as a whistleblower. This is an idea from Pastor Bob Kaler. Uh, and he uses the example of Sharon Watkins, who you perhaps might remember from her role as a vice president at Enron. She was a whistleblower who was in the news back in 2000, uh, 2006, 2006, when she came forward to testify during the conspiracy and fraud trial of the chairman of Enron that you may remember back then of Kenneth Lay was his name. Uh, and he, she had, before the company collapsed back in 2001, brought her concerns about some shady uh, practices and some suspect accounting uh, on the part of the chairman and uh, some others at high levels to a friend at their accounting firm, the company's accounting firm, who told Enron's auditor, who then told Congress. In the end, Watkins got a lot of praise for what she did. She was even named Time Person of the Week uh, and singled out as perhaps, according to the Wall Street Journal, the closest thing to a public hero that to emerge from the Enron saga. She even made it to the lecture circuit and made some money on, uh, on, on her uh, lecture circuit. What happened to Sharon Watkins is often the exception. So often what happens to these people who come forward as whistleblowers is not praise or acclaim or even um, financial benefit. It's one of hostility, harassment, uh, beratement, becoming a prior in your company if you stay in it, or finding it hard to get a job if you leave it. One who is often forced to use every penny of their assets to defend themselves legally one that will often drain people emotionally, even lead to death, threat, death threats, uh, sometimes labeled as uh, tattletales and obviously with words that can be far worse. Interestingly, even though you might think of Esther as a whistleblower, the word itself has only been in our uh, lexicon since the 1970s. Um, and in a relatively short time, so difficult has it been to uh, come forward as a whistleblower? We even have laws that are meant to protect them. Even those, uh, even those laws have struggled to keep people from, as we have seen in recent years, to keep people from being demoted or fired uh, or singled out uh, for what they are trying to do, often feeling like uh, in an honorable way. Usually a whistleblower comes forward when someone, whether it's in a company or in some level of government or in an organization, uh, spots wrongdoing 
and uh, where those higher up the chain of command ignore it or don't pay attention to it and pass it along uh, or sit on it or don't pass along rather or sit on it or hide it or worse conceal it it's often when a whistleblower will come forward for Esther and Esther's story, we find something very different than Enron, but one that we can relate in so many ways to today. It's helpful to, to keep in mind that uh, Esther uh, and her story come from those Jews who remained in the Persian Empire even after the exile had finished. Uh, it was about 486 BC that a king named Ahasuerus came to the uh, came uh, to the Persian throne, and he um, was a, a, an unusual fellow, a little bit hard to predict. Some might use the word mercurial. Um, he didn't think ahead particularly much, um, and uh, this sometimes got him into trouble. Some years after he had been on the throne, he mar married a, uh, a young woman by the name of Esther, the, the subject of our story today. She was Jewish, but the royal court nor the king was aware of this. Sometime later, we're not quite sure exactly how later, but uh, Esther's cousin Mordecai overheard a plot to kill the king as Tamara had outlined. Um, he, that is Mordecai, sent a warning to Esther, who warned her husband, and the plotters were executed. The kingdom and the king was saved. But there was another man named Haman. He was a psychophant, uh, and he had a lot of power. He uh, had a, a, follow, a lot of, a pretty big following in the court. Um, he was wealthy, uh, and he had a lot of means. And he did not like Mordecai. Um, once uh, one writer talked about this as being a, uh, because Mordecai could see Haman for who he was. Perhaps you've known of someone who uh, publicly presented themselves as something different than they really were, uh, or only in a certain way to gain advantage over people. And how, uh, though a lot of people could follow that, person or were persuaded to uh, do what that person said that uh, some people could see right through. Well, this was what Mordecai was able to do with him. He could see right through him. He could see uh, what he was up to. Um, Esther's intervention in Haman's plan to kill the Jews in revenge for what Mordecai had done was a lot riskier than one might think. Um, and as Tamar had outlined for us, she couldn't do this uh, the way you would normally think of, well, of course a wife could go see her husband. He was still the king, and though she was married to him, she could only see him when summoned. Uh, it was very risky to appear any other way. She had to really develop, uh, as you heard in the story, a, a, this elaborate plan to be able to even have an audience and then to present her case and then to get the opportunity to make her request. Had she held back because she knew that what she was doing was going to risk her life? Had she held back because what she was doing could potentially even risk um, the lives of, of her sister and brother Jews? Had she held back because she feared for what the king might do, broadly speaking? Probably the story would have turned out differently. Probably we wouldn't even know of the story. At least there's a good chance we would not. So often in history, it's the one voice, or maybe a couple of voices, that are able to speak out and speak up that make the difference. Sometimes we don't even know when we see something that we think is wrong or we know something in our heart doesn't feel right, 
sometimes it's hard to know how to even put into words what we're seeing. We just feel out in our gut that something is amiss. We feel in our heart that something isn't quite right. But even when we can form words, whether it's on paper or words we know we could speak, it's very intimidating to speak, whether it's to a governmental official, uh, to law enforcement, to a pastor, to uh, a boss, um, to the owner or uh, manager of a business, um, to the leader of a, of a nonprofit, to a Congress person or senator, it's, it's often very frightening, especially if we realize that our name could be attached to a complaint. Um, we will often hope somebody else will step forward, that someone else will take on the risk. You could look at recent examples and whether you, whether, whatever you felt of um, the politics of what they might be saying, you know that when Christine Blasey Ford came forward to testify to Congress about the Supreme Court nominee, what uh, she went through and continues to go through as a result of coming forward. Or perhaps you might think of Colonel Vindman in his testimony before Congress uh, early this year. They, uh, both emotionally and in uh, professional terms and in, for their families have uh, paid a significant price. Esther showed us a real model for courage. Not only did she see something that was wrong and thought about how to say it, she put together a plan knowing that it would be at risk to her, but it was also something that had to be done. So celebrated is what she did, so celebrated that what she did that Jews today have a festival named in the honor of these events. It's called uh, Purim. And uh, it's a story really about uh, the goodness that can come from our, our actions uh, on the behalf of others. You might say that the characters in the story today represent characters not only in their own time, but characters in our time. You have, for example, King Ahasuerus. Uh, he was rich and powerful, privileged, uh, somebody who made, was made to rash decisions. Um, not particularly good or particularly evil, um, uh, but someone wanted, who uh, wanted things to continue to go well, uh, certainly for him, uh, doesn't really get uh, particularly uh, deep into the details. Um, and somebody, if we were drawing comparisons today, might be to the leader who wants to be able to say, I wasn't aware of it, even if something goes wrong in his empire or uh, his organization. He's quite content to let other people handle the details and he handle the big, big picture things. You have someone like Haman who truly personifies evil in the story. Uh, someone who's vain and greedy, uh, hateful, uh, out to get all that he can, uh, very sneaky, very wealthy, and has a position of power. Uh, also very dangerous. Uh, he's the go-to guy, not only when you want something done, but when you want something done that will stretch uh, the boundaries of what is acceptable. In our world, uh, world today, we might call them the establishment or the agency or the corporation um, or the administration of a company or organization uh, like Enron might have been considered. You have Mordecai, the one who is good and decent but has neither wealth nor power nor position. Um, we might call him the consumer, uh, served by uh, the administration of the court or the government that was represented by the empire. but. Truthfully, people in high places and high positions don't really care much about people in his place. They are merely subjects to be handled as the king sees fit. And then, of course, you have Esther. Esther is fascinating because since she's married to the king, she is an insider, but she has no particular power or influence. 
And although she is a queen, it means very little. It's almost one small step uh, better than Mordecai. She might on occasion have the king's ear, but she has no real authority in any way. It's nothing like a marriage of equals that we would think about uh, commonly uh, in today's world. Um, being queen simply meant that among the many women that the king was married to, um, in the king's harem, as you might say, she was the first among them. Um, but again, that, that had very little um, major significance. Esther is notable because of the goodness she shows. This goodness comes out in several ways. One is that it is a goodness that is courageous, um, but it's not a, a superhero mode. It, it, this goodness doesn't fly out of the air like Superman and it doesn't swing through uh, from building to building like Spider-Man. Uh, this goodness uh, confronts head on the situation uh, takes on some risk uh, for the betterment of others. She clearly puts herself on the line to save many, many, many more people. Her goodness is also, uh, and this again comes from Pastor Bob Kaler, talks about uh, a goodness that's rooted in God. Uh, she has decided to act, but before she does, she asks all of her fellow Jews to join with her in a three-day fast. And though God is not specifically named, those reading the story and familiar with fasts in the Jewish tradition know that this is a means of seeking God's help and blessing. So they ground what they do uh, in their faith and take that seriously. Um, Esther's goodness is also not uh, naive. The goodness is really uh, uh, clever. And I don't necessarily mean sneaky, but, but wise. Well, with the wisdom that, that um, suggests that she's far from an innocent or um, unthinking kind of person. I say innocent of, as in not being uh, wise to the ways of the world. She takes the risk of approaching the king on her own, but she does it in, in such a way that she increases her chances of being welcomed into his court. Um, she makes a banquet and really sets the stage for the king to ask what it is that she is interested in. Um, she really lays the groundwork. She does the hard work uh, so that her request is uh, or so that uh, the king offers her anything that she would request. All throughout, of course, she never really loses sight of her goals or forgets herself. Of course, most, and maybe most obviously, her goodness is focused on other people. Although she was herself in no immediate danger, maybe would have even escaped the, uh, the, uh, the death that was to come to the Jewish people she nonetheless acted on behalf of all of them, uh, even at the risk of herself. She didn't have to be a martyr. She didn't even have to sacrifice herself to uh, point out the unseemly actions that were taking place in the presence of the king and in his court. It's this goodness, it's a powerful force when we unleash it. And sadly enough, often when people gain power, even those who've been good, will find over time that that power will corrupt them, that they become comfortable with the power or invested in the benefits of the power, even when they begin to use that power against or not on behalf of those that they're supposed to serve. character of a whistleblower is a lot like this goodness that Esther has shown. I can't say that all the whistleblowers we've ever seen are rooted in God, but I, I know that if you read the stories, many of them are. Um, they certainly see that their role is on behalf of the larger society, 
often in our country. They will do it on behalf of our country, uh, on behalf of other people, on behalf of innocent people. There's always a, f a focus on someone else. Um, there's often in these people a moral compass that helps them to discern when something wrong is being done at the literal expense of another person or group of people. Um, and yes, so often these people have a profound courage. We may not find ourselves in the halls of government or the halls of power or the halls of prestige. But around us, or even in our conversations, we probably will hear about those in those positions of power and influence. Probably it's often when we hear of people excusing poor behavior or even criminal behavior. We want to maintain our friendships. We want to keep on uh, getting along. We don't always say or speak up in ways that might be helpful, the ways that might further the gospel. I can certainly understand that on a, on a level of friendship, depending on the, on the nature of your friends. And I would hope that at least some of your friends could would be in a position over time where you could have those places where you might even be able to agree to disagree when you're in different places. So Esther's story also points out to the significance of being able to speak to those uh, in power or who have decision-making authority over us. That if we see somebody uh, using money for their personal purposes or making decisions to help their friends, but not the people they serve, or people using their power to harm uh, those trying to make an honest living or doing things the right way, that we might say something, that we might call for a legislator's office, that we might write a letter, that we might speak to a city councilor or a town manager or a boss, or it might be in an HR department perhaps, um, and raise those kinds of questions. We see in the story of Esther hope for those in a minority position in the current uh, protests over the, the, the killing of George Floyd. We find many people seeing something that has been present all along, um, but just had not ever been filmed in the way it was in George Floyd's death which is that the day-to-day -day experience of many people in our country is not one without fear. Uh, it is in fact one where they, even, uh, even when it comes to those who uh, protect and defend us, is filled with fear uh, because of experiences like that. For those of us, especially those of you listening today who are from the majority culture um, or who are men, uh, who are white, for example, um, who don't have these kinds of experiences, it's easy to dismiss them. We are as if we were the people of power, the people of influence. And often, in fact, it's been portrayed as we are the ones, whether the do whatever form of the dominant culture you might be, of having something to lose or something to uh, have to give up. Esther, where she here, might look at it differently and see what might be gained from, get, from acting in goodness that lets others reclaim the image of God in which they were made, in which we see the inherent goodness in each person, the inherent ability of everyone, and that everyone deserves the opportunity to have the life that God has granted them. Of course, Esther's story also gives hope for all of us. Because in the end, goodness is, as the hymn says, goodness is stronger than evil, and love is stronger than hate. Even if it doesn't always turn out that way in the world because of the reality of human sin, we know at the end of, of uh, time, the way God has thought about it, 
whether at the end of our life or the end of the world as we presently know it, whenever that day may be, that God will have the last word, not the evil, not the carnage, not the horrible actions of some, but in the loving wonders that God has offered. When we come to the table in a few moments, we celebrate that goodness God gives us each and every day. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for all that you have given us, especially the wellspring today of courage that dwells in each of us. We may not feel like courageous people. We may not feel like we have a voice. Help us so to center ourselves on you that whether we are outspoken and outgoing or reserved and to ourselves, we can find, even in small but no less significant ways, ways to speak up when we see somebody's integrity or livelihood or well-being threatened, threatened because of selfishness, threatened because of greed, threatened because of a drive for power, uh, threatened because of our own ignorance, because we assume too often that other people live lives like us, think like us and believe like us, that there could be no one else in no other way. So come to us, O Holy Spirit, that we might have the courage to live the convictions of our faith. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. As we um, come to our time of prayer, I would first ask today if anybody has a, uh, has a, a prayer request that they would like to offer. Anybody? All right, then. Um, Reverend Tim, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, we haven't offered uh, the family of Audrey Silsby in prayer. She passed away a couple weeks ago, and her husband is Gary Silsby. For Audrey Silsby, and, remind, and her husband was? Gary Silsby. Gary. Who is the son of Ward Silsby. Many of you know both. Um, thank you, Bobby, for that. Anyone else? I will um, incorporate uh, prayers into our um, into the larger prayer today, just doing it a little bit differently. Um, and I invite you to pray for these people of our congregation as well as um, farther afield, uh, these people that we think about uh, each week as we pray. Uh, let us pray together. Holy God, we thank you on this day for all of the goodness that you offer to us in our lives. That so often you courageously have worked through your people throughout the ages, whether in uh, Moses or Joseph, or Abraham, or Isaac, or Jacob. Uh, so often the prophets took great risks to present themselves uh, to their kings of their day, or to the leaders of their day, or to the very people themselves. And yet, for all these examples, Jesus included, we confess that sometimes we struggle uh, to be courageous, to go to uh, the person 
and confront them or to speak truth with love to power. It's easier to get along. It's easier to not rock the boat. Sometimes, frankly, we would say and admit that we don't always have the energy to take on one more thing, especially in a time of crisis as we are now. So help us and guide us, we pray, along, along the way. Speaking up when we need to, standing courageously when our faith demands it. To not be afraid as some of our forebears were generations ago, uh, to stand up to the scourge of slavery, but to use faith to defend it or who were afraid to stand up uh, to the rulers of their day over the many centuries because of what they would lose in wealth or power. Well, the list could go on, including in our own day. Give us wisdom for the journey ahead and help us to remember figures like Esther who Show us a way of, of showing your goodness without resorting to further violence, who shows a way to your goodness by using her, in her case, using her smarts, using what position she had and abilities she had to truly make a difference uh, for other people in this world. God, we have many people in our own church family who are in need, as well as people in the region or connected to our families who need our prayers today. So we ask for prayers for Debbie and Lou Sharp, Darlene Nelder, Sheila Bellier, Dave and Marcia DeMerchant, Bob Sear, Emily Robin and James Stewart, Phyllis Sykes, Leona Mishu, Glenn Taggett, Megan Lombard, Dave Corvo, George and Joyce Noor, Richard and Susan Clark, uh, Clark Duty, Gary and Marilyn Langley, for Jerry Dare, Ruth Hare, Herman Wright, Emily Dyer, and for Audrey Silsby. We know that you hear our prayers for these persons and others in our hearts and minds today. And we know that you will give them the courage to face their days ahead in whatever their need may be. Give us the courage too in this time of pandemic, of economic uncertainty, of racial, racial reckoning, and a season of electoral politics to have the courage to face our future unafraid. Not because there are, uh, not by pretending that the challenges don't exist, but by recognizing the power of your presence and all that you give us in the midst of it all. So all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to briefly touch on some announcements for today. We uh, have our, well, actually following the service, we'll have a time of uh, virtual coffee hour. You can join us for, usually we spend about 10 to 15 minutes uh, on Zoom. It's just on Zoom. Uh, so if you're uh, listening to us on Facebook Live, feel free to come on over for a few minutes and join right in. Bring your coffee, your tea, or whatever you might like to have with you uh, and join in some conversation. Uh, on Tuesday night is our town hall uh, session, an opportunity to review the work of the reentry task group and to ask the questions that you might have. You should have by now received a survey and you have through Wednesday to return uh, to return your survey to be tabulated in our results. That'll be a big help to the, to the uh, reentry team as they consider options for the weeks ahead. Uh, you should also have received or should very shortly receive 
the full plan. Um, everyone should have that by the time we uh, meet on Tuesday night. That was mailed out <coughs> last week. Um, if you're unable to join us that night, uh, but have questions, feel you can certainly email them to me or email them to the church office so we can include those in our session uh, on Tuesday night. Also, uh, as you heard, those of you with us last week, Jocelyn continues to look for uh, or to advertise for our VBS in a box. If you have uh, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, or people in the community that, that might be interested in this a unique way to do Vacation Bible School in an online format. Uh, if you can let the church office know and or Jocelyn Langworthy, um, that would be uh, a great help to her. Uh, uh, the last Sunday of this month, July 26th, we are planning an outdoor service. We uh, will move that a week later if weather intervenes and uh, the worship committee will be meeting this week to work out further details. If uh, so, we should have more instructions about how to be something that we will do through, um, you know, using social distancing techniques uh, and other uh, health uh, guidelines that we've become accustomed to over the recent weeks. Uh, we are hoping that um, if it works well, we might at least while the warm season is with us, be able to do some more of those um, services. Are there any other announcements uh, to be made this morning? I have one additional one. Uh, I've received word from our uh, district office, and if you had did not see my note in the uh, in the last newsletter, we are now part of the Katahdin district, uh, uh, as we have reorganized the districts in our conference. Um, that. There is a group assembling from, uh, from throughout our conference to work on questions of how do we as a church respond to the questions of race and, um, uh, and respond to some of the, the, uh, the movement that has been happening around our country. Some of you may have seen, in fact, we've had uh, peaceful protests in our own communities these last weeks. If you have an interest in that, each church has been invited to have one or more people be part of a group, um, to be part of thinking about how we as a church can be part of that effort. Uh, indeed, it might feel very courageous to do that, depending on your experience. If you could let me know, um, so I can let the district office know, they'd like to know by the end of this week, so by Friday, uh, if there's somebody from our church who would be interested in being part of those conversations and that work. We now turn to our, uh, our offering. And again, I thank you all who have continued to faithfully uh, support the ministries of the church. And again, the, exam the uh, ways you can uh, do that are on your screen. Uh, let the church office know or let Tamara Wilcox, our financial secretary, know if you have any questions about how to do any of these methods. Uh, if that's something you'd like to know more about or would like to try. Let us now give thanks for the gifts God has given. pray. Holy God, the giver of all good and wondrous gifts, we thank you for all that you have given, and we pray that you can continue to use these gifts, albeit them in ways that we had never imagined through uh, four, five, six months ago, um, but continue to use them for good in our ministries and in our communities. Help us have good courage uh, and wise wisdom for the living of these days and the 
using of the resources you have blessed us so much with. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to take just a moment to make a little space here for the communion elements in front of me, and I would invite you to to gather your bread and juice or what what you have available for your elements today. Uh, the responses will appear on your screen. Um, they should be, for those of you been, who've been part of our services before, they should be familiar. You can find these if you happen to have a hymnal also um, to the front of our hymnal in the uh, service of Warden Table 1. So I invite you to join with me in our great Thanksgiving here as the liturgy appears on our screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, Pour it out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And I invite you to take whatever form of bread you have with you uh, and symbolically break it along with the rest of us, signifying not only the brokenness of our world, but how in that brokenness, Christ comes and meets us in those broken places as an agent of healing and of grace. And I invite you to take the cup as well, whatever cup you have, and remember that this cup that we give thanks today is a sharing in all that Christ offered in his life and continues to offer in the Holy Spirit today. It is our tradition in the United Methodist Church to observe an open table. That means you do not need to be a United Methodist to respond to the invitation to come to the Lord's table. If you are with others today, I would invite you to serve one another. You can use words like the body of Christ given for you or the blood of Christ shed for you, or you can simply do it in silence, knowing that God hears the prayers of your heart. Let's take a few moments now to receive the gifts that God has given. in the spirit of prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery. And in fact, join in with me since uh, the words are on your screen. Uh, Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery, which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn 717 in your United Methodist hymnals. It's three verses of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I invite you to hear echoes, not just of our own nation's history, but uh, the cries of those uh, of our sisters and brothers all around this world as we sing together. invite you to go to the next part of your day and to the week ahead filled with the spirit of Christ to be courageous in living not just when it's easy or not just when the majority is on your side but when other people might be counting on you the voiceless the powerless the, the uh, those without money those without position or prestige go forward with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit because God the Father, God in Christ, and God the Holy Spirit have promised to be with us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>